So thanks a lot, Tom and Søren, for, for inviting me at the IAS. It's a pleasure to be here, and in particular, thank you also for for organizing the seminar, although the schedule this week is so tight. And as Tom said already, I would like to say a few words on the rigorous derivation of the Vlasov equation. Now there's all mathematical physicists here, so please excuse if maybe the beginning is a little bit uh, slow, but I think it's very good to get the picture at the, 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 the beginning. And what I would like to do, initially I would like to do some heuristics, and later I would do uh, the rigorous Thing. So what I'm interested in is, as you might know, it's the derivation of m effective equations from microscopic dynamics. And I would like to look at something which is a very uh, obvious system. It's the uh, system where, which we all know already from high school. I'm interested in a system with n interacting particles. You could think of the particles as being stars, for example, and they are subject to Newtonian dynamics. So such a system is described uh, by a trajectory in phase space, and I would like to introduce the notation I will use in the talk. It's a vector QP, and Q stands for the position of the particles, P for their momenta, and I have n particles, so I get a vector in R6n, and the notation will always be like that. The position of the first particle will be Q1, its momentum P1, and so on. Just a note, the mass of all my particles will be equal to 1, so momentum and velocity will be the same during the talk. I will uh, use the same word for both. And um, as I said, these, uh, I'm looking at a Newtonian time evolution, so the Q dot is given by P, by the velocity, and P dot is given by some force term, which in this talk today only will depend on the position of the particles, not on their momenta. I will assume now that the fourth, which acts on the jth particle, so this is the notation here, I use the force on the jth particle only, so f is a vector in R3, and of course, so this is the, com the respective con three, uh, com three components here, is given by a pair interaction, f of qj minus qk, and I will use some coupling constant, which is n to the minus 1, where n is the particle number. You might say this looks unphysical. A coupling between two objects doesn't change if you increase the particle number. But you can argue for that by rescaling the system. So in fact, you have a system where you don't have a coupling, but you can rescale space and time in such a way that for the rescaled system, you have this n to the minus 1. It's a little bit more convenient to look at this rescaled system. So the true system might be the following. If you put more stars, the volume of the galaxy, let's say, grows proportional to n. And I'll scale everything down that the volume of my galaxy is always equal to 1. And if you rescale space and time, then you will directly arrive there, which uh, this is not very difficult. And I'm not doing this today. What I'm interested in is in a macroscopic law of motion, for the particle density. I was not so sure about the audience, so I made these pictures here to explain what I mean by particle density, and I would like to look at the coarse-grained empirical density. This picture will be important for, for later because I would like to form my galaxy now. And the way I form my initial condition will be the following way. Think of some initial function rho zero. It's a probability density. And I take stars in an independent way, in an IID way, and throw them into my galaxy. And this then forms my initial condition. And for this, I then want to solve my Newtonian equations of motion. So I throw in the first star, and it sits at some position Q, has some momentum P1. Q, then the second star might be there. And if I throw more and more, I can talk about the coarse grain density. I take some volume V which lives on an intermediate scale. The volume is much smaller than the volume of my galaxy, but it's still large, such that it contains many stars here. And then I can say, well, the density is just the number of particles divided by the volume. This gives me some nice function. Well, this is the, the heuristic part now, right? So it doesn't matter if the volume now is sharp or not, so we do not want to talk about that. And I give some uh, formula now. I can ask now the question, what is the force acting on a star sitting on a certain position? Well, and the, I, drew, I drew one of the stars in red color here now. Yes, it's one star. And I'm asking the question, which is the force acting on this position? Well, and of course, 
you have this pair interaction. You have the coupling constant n to the minus 1. You have the force of all the stars in a certain box. So J labels the different boxes here. I have this label J for the different boxes. So I can split up my whole space in different boxes with all the same volume V. And the force acting on the, this position is, of course, the force coming from all the particles in this box. The number of particles is nj, and n to the minus 1 was the coupling I always had. Now, you can, using the definition, using the definition uh, of this density, so the density is, of course, the number of particles per volume times n. And now, if I use this definition of the density, what I get is, this formula is the sum of v times rho times f. And now if I said the boxes will, be, will have small volumes, so this sum is, you can read as a Riemann sum, right? So it's close to an integral. It's close to the integral of rho in convolution, uh, rho times f of q minus qj. You integrate over the p and q coordinates. And this v is the volume element, of course. So this plays the role of the d3x. So you have integral d3x of this function. I will call this, this is now the notation I will use for this object, it's rho convolution with f. Be careful, you only convolute, convolute in, the, in the q coordinate, the p coordinate is fixed. You integrate over all momenta. Physically that's clear because the force does not depend on the momenta. You just integrate out the momenta, you don't care about them. And just the spatial distribution is important to see which force term you get. Now what happens? This coarse-grained empirical density of particles will depend on t. Why? Well, the particles move, so rho will be time-dependent. And since you have the conservation of phase space volume, you can find out the respective e equation which you need. So if you follow some of these volumes now, and follow this volume, you know that the num number n of particles sitting in this volume is conserved. But why is that the case? Well, one has to be... You're saying that the yeah? things that are constant, you're just saying you're pretending it's constant in the, in the, in the box. V. Yes. So you go with the box, you go with the flow, so to say, and the number of particles there is constant. Well, this is, first of all, I would like to uh, rem remind you of this force. Of course, for a general n-particle system, this is not the case, right? If the particles get entangled on so on, this is wrong. But what you have here, this force here actively acts only on one particle. So all the particles move in an independent way. And since they move in an independent way, you can say, well, the, the, instead of looking at the flow lines of a one particle system where you have the conservation, you can also add them up. And therefore, you get this conservation of uh, phase space volume in this effective one particle description which you have because of independence. So this of course holds only of leading order. This is still the heuristics of leading order. This is what you expect. Elliot, you look very unhappy. Is that right or? I'm sure it's happy. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so I have that the rho as a function of t and if you follow the q and p, so if you take the q and p that follow the trajectory, this is constant. Yes. It's not. It's, it's constant, but it, everywhere. I mean. No, it's only constant if you, you, let's say this is in, in, the box, right? in the box. In the box, you follow the trajectory of the particle which sits in the center, and the box moves with this particle. You don't want to integrate out the. You don't want to integrate out the momentum. No, that's not what you do. No, okay. that's it's that's a, the box really is a box in R six. Oh, it's, so it's it's a box, it's not just in position space. Yeah, it's, it's a, a box, box in phase, phase space. space. Yeah. Okay. Space. So this is constant, and then you can guess the evolution equation, and this we all know it's the continuity equation. So the time derivative, the partial time derivative respect to t, is if you take the total time derivative, you have this, then you have the spatial derivative times q dot, the Time uh, the momentum derivative times p dot. And we know that q dot, of course, since it's a Newtonian system, is given by p. And p dot, of course, is given by this force. And it should be the force which we have guessed now at the beginning. As I said, this all is heuristics. This is what we expect. And if I plug in the force which I have guessed before, you arrive at this equation. And you could call this the Vlasov equation. 
So this is a nonlinear equation. You see the density rho here appears quadratically here on this point. And this is a nonlinear equation now. And you expect that this now describes this coarse grained empirical density of your system. Now this was the heuristic part. Now comes the rigorous part. So now uh, I would uh, yes. Maybe you can just stop and, and say a little bit more about this last solver equation. Yes. I'm not so familiar with it. I've seen it a few times, but yes. I don't know anything about it. So so you have a you have a gradient in Q and a gradient in, in P. Yes. Uh, and then so where the nonlinear part is only in the last term or uh, yes. This is linear, so this is just. So that's some kind of, that first piece is some kind of advection, or what? Pardon? That's just some kind of ad advection? This, yes. And here you have this uh, nonlinear force term. And yeah, this is nonlinear. <laughs> so, of course, yeah, we could discuss the solution theory. So, depending whether this uh, force here is attractive or repulsive, there is, of course, uh, there might be question of breakdown and all these things. Well, the point is. For this talk, I would want to do the micro to macro, so I don't want to talk so much about the solution theory. In the repulsive case, it's easy that you have uh, existence, global existence and uniqueness of solutions for very, very general initial condition. And even in the attractive case, you get uh, such results with uh, some restrictions on the initial condition. But for the talk, I will always assume that this uh, row is well behaved so that you have an L infinity solution of this density row, at least at some bounded time interval. And you have restrictions on the potential and you This will well, right? come soon, the restrictions on the potential. So, so, so are there global, are there, yeah, are there global existence or, or, or for, let's say, repulsive interactions? Yes. Or what? So there are. For, for under suitable initial condition, there are results like that, even in the attractive case. Mm -hmm. And there, of course, it's, if, the, if, it, if the force gets too singular, uh, well, it doesn't work anymore. But, but, but there's. But yeah. are you worried about short range singularity or longer range? For, 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 for this year, I'm, the long range behavior does not matter so much. The short range singularity yeah, are, are very similar. But that will be on the next one of the next slides. Yeah. <coughs> so now I would like to go to the rigorous part. So as I said, I'm not want to say so much about the solution theory. Let's assume we have some L infinity solution on some fixed time interval. And I would do the micro to macro. And there's results going back to the 70s where people have looked at this system, for example, by Neunzert and Wick or Braun and Hept. And what they assume is that this interaction force here is globally Lipschitz. That's what they assume. And they can show them something which I like to call deterministic results. Why is it, do I call it deterministic results? Well, they say for any initial condition, which is such that, such that the empirical density, so the sum of the delta functions where my stars are sitting, converges to some sum function rho zero, they can show that this is also the case after some time t. You, of course, usually look at some weak notion of convergence. So the empirical density is a sum of deltas. Rho zero is some nice and smooth function. So in a strong th sense, this can't be close. You look at some bounded Lipschitz norm to estimate the distance. And whenever this is small, it will be small for later times. While this rho t empirical, there you, you follow the Newtonian dynamics and build the new density by summing the deltas. And this here is the solution of the Vlasov equation. I call this deterministic results because they say whenever this is the case, you get, you get this without caring how the galaxy will build. In contrast to that, I will talk about probabilistic results. So what I, I will do is, as in the picture, I will throw in the stars into the galaxy randomly. And I will, at the end, say, well, with small probability, things can go wrong. But with high probability, you still see the Vlasov equation. This is the difference. So when you say the term deterministic, this first arrow, row empirical goes to not yeah. in the large n limit. Yes, it's in the large n limit. Large n limit. And then, then you've taken that limit and then you let t go. Or, yes. Or what? You don't, yes. There's a, it's an important you, you say you have some, some row zero which you have in mind. Then you put in delta functions there, let's say a thousand, the way you would want to have them. And if you say, OK, the distance between that is, let's say, small, then you can show that after the time has evolved, it's still small. Okay. Now matter how you put them. Uh, OK, so, uh, but, but the distance is, is measured in some weak topology? Yes, it's, it's, it's measured usually uh, using bounded uh, Lipschitz norm okay. between these two objects. 
Of course, physically interesting is the Coulomb case. So the physics uh, of this of Lars of equation is important if you describe galaxies as I motivated the system, or also plasmas. So the fourth term is a Q vector over the modulus of Q3 with plus or negative, with positive or negative sign. Of course, you could add a coupling constant, but I just skip it for ease of notation. This, of course, is not uh, covered by these results because you have a singularity. You don't have a global Lipschitz constant for this force. And now the point is, for this force, this problem is still open. So no one until today can prove uh, that after some time t, you have some weak convergence. And uh, well, the art of the game is now to find at least something which gets close to it. And there was a paper by Uray and Jabin in 2014, and they looked at the following case. They looked at a force which is slightly below Coulomb. So they weakened the singularities here a little bit. And they imposed a cutoff at n to the minus 1, 6. So now if you impose a global cutoff, of course, you still get the old result. But this cutoff now is independent. So if n gets large, this is the, the, singular, the, the interaction gets more and more singular. And they could show, at this case, that under excluding some particular untypical initial conditions, that they have, again, that the empirical density is close to rho t. So they had to exclude some cases, though they couldn't say whenever this here converges, they had to exclude some cases and to explain why this has to be done. I would to sh sh show you a following picture. One can even show that the general case is wrong. I have a picture here of a patchless series of students of mine. You could now look at the following thing. Well, now I said, well, Ure and Jabin, they have probabilistic results. So they say, OK, in some exceptional cases, things they can control the things. You might say, maybe this is a technical problem. If you work harder, you can prove something. But I say, no, that's not the case. There are really examples where initially it's closed, but later it is not. And I would like to give you the picture of such an example. So let's assume we have our initial condition is such that, that we have a number of epsilon to the minus 1. Epsilon will then be a small number, clusters, and each of them containing epsilon times n particles. Since you have many such clusters, if you look at it from afar, you can still see a nice density rho zero if you put the clusters on the right position. So you can still slowly converge weakly against your rho zero. But you know what will happen now in the repulsive case? Let's think of the repulsive situation. Now, if you have an interaction which is singular, you know that these energy of these particles or the force, in particular and the particles in the boundary, will be very large. That goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. Because the number of particles is more or less of order n. The coupling constant was 1 over n, so this drops. But you still have the singularity with a cutoff of n to the minus 1, 6. So it still gets bad as n goes to infinity. And we all know what will happen. This will explode. And of course, since these particles, since this potential energy will be transferred into kinetic energy, these particles will fly away very fast and it will have nothing to do with the solution of the Vlasov equation. Of course, now it is clear, if you think of what I said at the beginning, if you randomly throw particles into your galaxy, you will never form such a state, right? You will not form very few, very strong clusters. It will be much smoother. So it's clear that uh, with this picture, this here is, has very small probability if you create your galaxy the way I said. This is the, this is the repulsive case? This is a repulsive case. Well, also in the attractive case, one has arguments that it might break down. OK. You say it shouldn't matter, yeah, it shouldn't matter no. Scattering, yes. Instead of going this way, it goes way. Absolutely, I agree. So I think, but for the picture, it's more <coughs> convincing if you have the repulsive place. It's completely clear, yeah. So now what I want to do now is, yes? But if you consider galaxies. Yes. Yes. Objects, yes. Like yeah, I think, but that happens on a long time scale. So I'm talking about time scale of order one, and the order one means at that time order where the density has changed 
significantly, right? If the density, so to say, gets really different from the density before, then you have that. And this clustering, this will happen, but the time scale is a different time scale than what I'm talking about. Well, you still have a deviation from the from the blouse of things. So you will also transform energy uh, by the attraction. You will transform energy. Single particles will be kicked out. You know, for example, the single particles will, will get these uh, kinetic energy you get by, by f even strengthening the cluster and you will have all kinds of things going on. Pardon? Yes, right. And these would be a problem. These particles uh, escape very fast and have nothing to do with the Vlasov equation right. anymore. So it will not Let's be the same. Pardon? It will not be the same if there is a attractive force than, uh, than the repulsive force. In both cases, it will be not the same as the Vlasov equation. That's what I'm claiming. So for your example, do you need to have many clusters or can you just do this with one cluster? Well, if you only have one cluster, you would say, since at the end of the day you do some deconvergence, this doesn't matter so much, right? If you only have few clusters, you can forget so about it. Even most or many, a macroscopic number of particles has to be in some of the clusters. Okay. Then you're in trouble. You really, need, you really need several. Yes, yes. Could you come back to Ali's uh, question? If you, you, you said that you see on different time scales this <coughs> cluster, this formation of galaxies. Yes. Is that true in the Vlasov equation or is that true in the microscope? It's in the microscopic system. The Vlasov equation does not uh, describe clustering in, in, in that way as you form galaxies. Okay, I would like to go back now to the comparison between the micro and the macro system. As I said before, if you compare in some uh, uh, bounded Lipschitz norms or in some weak topology these two objects, and I do something completely different, and this is what I want to explain. Maybe I go back to what I said here. The reason is the following. You, you want to explain, yeah, you want to compare uh, the solution of the Vlasov equation, this rho t, with this trajectory in phase space, right? With the QP, so which solves the Newtonian's equation of motion. So you have two completely different objects. The one is a trajectory, the other one is a density. And you have to bring them to the same level when you compare them. Well, what people in most cases do, you translate the trajectory into a density by saying, okay, you have the delta functions on the position, then you say this is a density, and you compare it in the weak sense. And what I will do now in the next slide is I do the opposite. I translate, so to say, the density into a trajectory. And how this is done, I would like to explain you now. So remember the Vlasov equation, and we assume that this initial rho zero is given. We solve the Vlasov equation. We assume we have a nice solution, some L infinity solution on a fixed time interval. Our true system, remember, looks the following. The trajectory q dot is p, p dot is f. This is clear. And now I want to introduce a new trajectory. And I would like to compare my old system with the new one. And what I do is the following again. I want to have a Newtonian system, and I, the new system gives, gives, gets this bar. Q bar dot is again P bar. P bar dot is again sum given by some F of, oh, there's a bar missing, F bar of Q bar, I'm sorry. And now I use as the force, not the pair interaction, but the mean field force. So I use this force, which I have guessed heuristically before. I use this force, the row now is given, I've solved the Vlasov equation in the beginning, so this is now given, and I use the same force for every particle. Which means that these particles now move independently. You don't have a pair interaction, you don't form correlations, everybody has his own force term here, and I assume also that initially those two trajectories match. The goal is to prove that after some, some time d, also qt, will be close to q bar t, and p t will be close to p bar t, so that both describes the same system. In which sense this closeness is meant, this is something which I will define on one of the next slides. Before I do that, I would like to summarize the results we get by that. So we make this comparison of these two things, and what we get is the following. Uh, there's a paper I have with one of my students. We also started with some force which is likely uh, uh, less singular than Coulomb, 
but we could have a cut of n to the minus one third compared to n to the minus one six. And this is an interesting this uh, value because it's uh, the distance to the nearest neighbor typically, right? You have a volume of order one n particles. The next friend is n to the minus one three away from you. We could improve that, changing slightly uh, the, the technique to the true Coulomb case with a slightly worse cutoff. And I would like to talk today about the first result because uh, really the technique is more or less the same, but there's a few subtleties which are, uh, can be written in an so easier what way. After the cutoff, then you just make it to be one or smooth. One? Just, just smooth, yeah, just smooth out because, of course, it, it is, I will also need that the derivative of f is nice. And at zero, of course, uh, the force has to be zero such that it's smooth, so some smoothing out. So, what we do is now the following remember that the initial conditions are iid for the stars. Remember the picture I built my galaxy by throwing stars in an iid way. Well, I have some initial row on the phase space. You give me a row on R6, which yeah. is a probability density, okay. and I throw in these particles okay. given by this, this oh, okay. R6. So, so you're, given, you're, given, you're given the row to begin with. I give the row, row zero at the beginning, and I throw in my particles now in an IID way. This gives me some natural way of measuring probabilities. <laughs> so the probability distribution initially will be the product, because I did it in an IID way. And this sample space I have is the R of 6n. Now, my initial situation is random, but my system is deterministic, which means that this qt, pt, q bar, bt, p bar t are random variables. They are determined by this random initial object. And if you remember for this auxiliary or for this new time evolution with the uh, trajectory, I have independence. This is, of course, very important technically for what I will I do next. So for NET, also there, I, uh, independence is conserved because every particle felt some external force and there was no pair interaction. And the probability density, this uh, you can easily see, is the product of rho t, where, where rho solves the Vlasov equation. By the law of large numbers, now it is clear that the q bar p bar converges in probability against the rho, rho t again in some weak topology. So what I have to show is, as I said before, that my QP is close to Q bar B bar, then I'm done. This is the goal. And now comes the details. So we look at the sub-Coulomb case now for, for this talk. And I want to like, would like to prove the following theorem. So this is the main result for today. I want to show that for any T, the following holds. I compare the true trajectory with this auxiliary trajectory here. In the subnorm, so it's a very strong notion of closeness if this is small. And I can show that this is smaller than n to the minus. I, I, I want to show, look at the situation where this is smaller than n to the minus one third. And I can prove that the probability goes to one as n goes to infinity. This is a surprisingly strong result, I must say, because of course the if infinity norm is something very strong. Only if, if just a single particle escapes away for a distance which is a little bit more than n to the minus one third, you're lost. And this is uh, an event which you do not count here. But this is something we can show. And now it might get even more surprising, because I can even give error estimates for that. And the error estimate is such that it's the, the probability uh, um, the probability for that is, is, is bounded by 1 minus c gamma n to the minus gamma. So smaller, so the close uh, the, the, of, of, of the other set, the probability is smaller than any polynomial in n. This is a surprisingly strong result, but I think I cannot give the full rigorous proof. But what I will do now should be convincing that you believe me that this is true. So what I do now. To prove this result, I define the following random variables, jt, which is written here. Just before I explain the jt, at the moment it drops a little bit from the skies, right? It just uh, is like an ansatz. On the next slide, I will explain you the properties of j and why this j is so interesting and helpful. Just let us look at the object. I look at the difference between true and 
the mean field trajectory, again an infinity norm, and multiply with n to the one third, and I cut it off at the value one. So whenever this here is larger than one, I keep the value one here. This is what is written there. I will show you in the next slide that I can prove the following lemma. I can show that the time derivative of the expectation value is bounded by that. This is some estimate I would like to do. And you know with Grönwald's lemma you get then that this a g t, this a expectation of g will, will be bounded. Of course this bound is not uniform in time, so only on a fixed time interval in the limit n to infinity you get something nice. Because the reason is, of course, this j0 here is the difference at time 0, but at time 0 we use the same trajectory, so this j0 is exactly 0. So, of course, also the expectation value of that is 0, and therefore I get here something small. And the point is now, I, I think I have some space on, on the blackboard there. I would like to show you how to do this and why this expectation value here is helpful. So, so the key is this, is this lemma, right? I mean, I, I, my understanding things correctly that this, this normal type of inequality. Yes, right. That, that's, that's where everything is. Yes. So this is what you do. And how I do this is something which I would like to show you now. Let me wait for a second what I have. Ah, this is the last slide, okay. So what I do now is the following. I would like to explain, you know, on the blackboard why this J is the, the right thing to look at. So the point is now, first of all, why does this prove the theorem? If the expectation value of J is small, and this is what we get here by Grünwald, we know that the probability to hit the one here is small. So this here, this j is a positive random variable. If its expectation value is small, then the probability to hit the one is small. And yeah, what is the probability to hit the one? The probability to hit the one is the probability not to be inside of the set, right? So if this is small, we have an estimate for that. And we will even show that this is exponentially small, well, not in this talk, but in general. Now, I would like to say a few words on this JT. I hope everything can, can see when I st stand here. Now, the point is as follows. You could say, well, why not do a Grönwald inequality for this probability? You could start, well, let's take this probability here and do some Grönwald thing. The point is, the reason why I don't want, don't want to do this is the following, that the probability has some sharp edges. I would like to explain you why. So each probability, Let's call this set which I have here A. Let's assume we want to estimate the probability for A, where A is the following set. It's the set where this difference QP minus Q bar P bar. Let's say this is the complement of A, so I take the other set where this is larger or equal to n to the minus one third. Let's look at this set, and you could say, well, let's try to do a Grünwald estimate for P of A. I tell you now why this expectation value of J is morally the same, but from the technical po point of view, better to do. Well, if you have the P of A, you can say, well, each probability you can translate into an expectation value. It's the expectation value of the characteristic function of the set A, right? This is the same thing. Now, a characteristic function if you look at the set, let's say here is, is the set A, here's A complement. The characteristic function is zero here, one there, so it's very steep. So whenever a trajectory leaves the set, you change the value from zero to one, or from one to zero. Now what does the J do? It's also one inside the set A, right? Whenever you're inside the set A, it's one. But between, if you leave the set A, it gently goes down to zero. And when Q, P, and Q bar, P bar match, it's exactly zero, and in between it goes gently down. From the technical point of view, this is of course much better, because if now some trajectory leaves here, you don't have all of a sudden a change from one to zero, but it smoothly goes down. And I need smoothness, of course, because I want to control the time derivative of this object. <laughs> this is very helpful. And on the other side, you know, it does more or less the same as the probability, because of this argument, when expectation value is small, you have the probability. 
Now you could say, well, why not take the expectation value just of this object or just of this guy here without cutting off at one? Well, this you will see in a second. And this is now what I would like to explain you. The point is now if j of t is equal to 1, this implies directly that q p minus q bar p bar, a uh, q bar p bar, in infinity norm is smaller than n to the minus one third. Uh, sorry, it's so when this is smaller than one, then this here has to be smaller than n to the minus one third. Now consider the following situation. We want to estimate the time derivative of these objects here. We're interested in the time derivative of E. Whenever your random variable j has the value 1, it cannot grow any further. It has reached its maximum. So whenever it has reached the value 1, the, the inequality will be trivial. You only have to consider the cases where j is smaller than 1. This is the only case you have to consider. But this means that you have this boundary condition, so to say. You have some kind of a boundary condition which says that only those cases where this here holds are those where you have to do estimates at all. And this is remarkable because if you compare with the results with Auré and Jobin, for example, they had to put some boundary condition at the very beginning and show that find a boundary condition at time equal to zero such that at time equal t you don't have clustering anymore. Now we get this boundary condition for free, so to say, automatically by defining the random variable in that way. And now you might wonder, why is this helpful? Why does this say you don't have clustering? Let's look at it. Well, Q bar P bar is the IID situation. There you can't cluster because the clustering is, well, by the law of large numbers, very strongly suppressed. So the probability to have a cluster is extremely small. Then the estimates will be very simple because of the probability is so small, the expectation value will be easy to control. Typically, you don't have a cluster. Now let's look at QP, the true system. Now you say, OK, the QP, you know, it's close to Q bar P bar. Each particle can be only moved by n to the minus 1 third. Well, if I say I have a nice and smoothly distributed <coughs> cloud there, and you allowed to move any star not more than the distance to the next neighbor, you will not be able to form any bad clusters like in the picture before. So you know that you have automatically a boundary condition which suppresses the clustering. So what was the time, Tom, you said? Uh, how? Uh, you, you got a little bit more time. OK. OK, good. So I would like to say a little bit more about the technical stuff now. And this is what I do on the next slide. So, so yeah. Your mind is what, what, so, so you get uh, you get stronger results than the previous ones, or, or yes. Or, I mean, I can see the method seems to be much simpler. Um, yes. But maybe you could just remind us what. So this is our result. This is our theorem. I think the, inter the interesting part is less uh, the, the notion of convergence, but first of all, more the system itself. Yeah. And the, si the system itself, which we have, has a cutoff at n to the minus one third plus delta, and they had n to the minus one sixth. So our cutoff is such that we have a few particles in the cutoff region, they had still many, many particles in the cutoff if region. If you don't put that condition on, then, then your proof, I guess, obviously doesn't work. I mean, yes. is, is there something fundamentally that's going wrong or not? No, that's not the case. So what we are doing at the moment is we try to improve that um, by looking at some, something which is on the last slide, by the way. Maybe I can, can say something about that because we're there already and do the technical thing later because that might be interesting. So we want to remove the cutoff further. That's the point. Yeah, yeah. And the first thing we, we are trying now, and we already have some, some result which uh, I have to check right with my PhD student and where we get below this n to the minus one third. And what we use is that it's a second order of the equation. So the point is, if two particles hit, we now estimate some, somehow the modulus of the force. We make an estimate of the force. And if the force is too large, we are lost, and this dictates the cutoff. Now, but since you have particles which are moving, it might be the case that the force is strong only for a very short time, because the force is strong when the particles approach each other. When the, when the relative velocity is of order one, this is there only for a very short time. And to change, to get a more difference between these two systems, it's not the force which is relevant, but the force integrated over the time 
of the force. Uh, so the kick given by the force relevant. If one does that, one can improve that further. But now at the moment, we don't use this argument for this talk. So we can improve that. And I think the result itself is true, even if you have the full Coulomb case. This is what I think. But this is still some way to go, right? So what would you, so, so you're, you're going to take into account certain types of near collisions, right? Yes. There we really, in this new thing which we are doing, we really name different kinds of collisions. Collisions where the relative velocity is large and particles come very close and say they are fine. Then we have other collisions where the part relative velocity is small and they come close. They are bad, but there we estimate the probability in another way because having being close and having small relative probability is, is of course, again, very small. So we have different sets of, 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 yes. of, of things which are happening and estimate them but, but one after have, the other. Have a J the way you have we have, we still have a J, but in the J we, 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 we make the following, we, we name the different particles, so to say. We split up the, these particles, so the, this n vector, into different parts, yeah. and for each part we have a different J, and they play with each other, so they have to be defined in, 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 a, in, a, in, in, the, in a good way. But for most of the particles, this here still holds, because most of the particles will still be more or less fine. So this, if you have a small rel so yeah, most of the particles we use more or less the same J, and only for the bad collisions we do something else and do some more estimates. So maybe I, I, I can in the last, let's say, five to 10 minutes convince you of this exponential decay because uh, uh, this exponential uh, rate of the error, um, because this I think is interesting. And therefore, of course, I want to estimate the time derivative of this expectation value of J, as I said before. Because this is the lemma which I want to prove. You all agree if the lemma is proven, then we're done. And of course, this j, the time dependence is both in the q's and then the p's. And the one part is, is, is very simple because, of course, using tri triangle inequality, I can split that up. Of course, it's given by these differences, this difference times n to the minus one third, of course, is still uh, n pl plus one third is still there. Plus n to the one third p dot minus p bar dot. With this boundary condition, this is what I want to estimate. I want to estimate the expectation value of these guys when there's this boundary condition holds. Then I'm done. So this is easy because this is just p minus p bar dot. So this is just the thing which is written here, the difference between p and p bar. So q dot minus, this is just p minus p bar. So there you get Grünwald's estimate. So this here is bounded by the expectation value of j itself, right? Herefore, now I will have the forces. And here I have the force acting on q minus the mean field force acting on q bar. And now remember the following thing. This system here, the idea is, of course, to use at some point law of large numbers argument. At the moment, I can't use this because for the q trajectories, this is not in an IID situation. There you have correlations. Here I could do it. So what I do here is I write this guy here in the following way. By trying is inequality, so let's forget about this. I just go on with this guy here. By trying is inequality, I can bound this in the following way. I take f of q as it's written here. I subtract f of q bar. And I add f of q bar. I subtracted it, I add it again, and then I didn't change anything and copy what is written here. The second guy now is easy to do because this is just law of large numbers argument. Here you only have q bars, so it's IID. The f bar is, of course, the expectation value of f. If you return and look what I did, I averaged out somehow in this heuristic argument. So you can really easily see that this is the expectation value. So this is really directly the textbook 
law of large numbers argument which you can use here to control this guy. For this guy now, I would like to draw a picture to show that this can be estimated. For this other thing, the, um, this bar condition I haven't used so far. And of course, if you remember my picture with these clusters which are exploding, at one time it should be really relevant in the proof to have this boundary condition. At one time it must be helpful, and this is now to control this difference. And therefore I would like to draw the following picture. Maybe I recall you that f of q minus f of q bar can be written in the following way. It's a 1 over n coupling. And if you look at the jth component only for the moment, and if I want to uh, estimate the subnorm, I look at the, it component-wise and do the supremum at the end. This is given by f of q j minus qk minus f of q j bar minus qk bar. So this is what I want to estimate and then take the subnorm of that. So k not equal to j. And therefore I would like to draw a picture. So in the picture I would like to draw f and here I draw something which I call x. So the f will be smooth and here I have some cutoff and here will be the Coulomb force. Yeah, this is the Coulomb force. And now let's look at something I call q and q bar. Of course q will be qj minus qk, q bar will be q bar j minus q bar k. So what I want to estimate is the difference of the force here and there. This is what I want to have. I want to have a, the difference of the force. Now what you, one can do is now the following. You could say, well, let's do a Taylor expansion. So we can say the difference of the force is proportional to this distance times the largest derivative which I have on this interval between q bar and q. This is something you could do. This is very nice because it gets you close to the Grünwald estimate. Well, if this difference would be order one, so if you would be in the Lipschitz case, it would be proportional. You would again have something which is proportional to the distance between q and q bar. Then you can close the Grünwald estimate. Then this distance here, which I'm just estimating, is proportional to q minus q bar, the infinity norm, and I'm done. But in this case, of course, we are not Lipschitz, and we have to do something else. But the point is now, this f of q minus f of q bar modulus is bounded in the following way. It's bounded by yeah, using Taylor q minus q bar times the derivative of f at the worst case. In this case, the largest derivative you have at q in this picture. It also could be q bar, one of those guys. But if it's q bar, it's fine, because when it's q bar, you can say, well, I have this f prime of q bar. Then I can say, OK, my I define g to be the sum of these f primes at the different q bars. Again, I could use my law of large numbers argument. I use, have these q bars. They are i, i, d distributed, everywhere equally distributed. Well, the f prime is, of course, singular, but it doesn't matter. You hit the singularities only with a few particles. You can average out. And then you find that this goes through. And this determines the cutoff. You can only do that if the cutoff is n to the minus 1 third. So at one point, of course, I have to tell you, where do I need the cutoff? This is exactly here. Now you might say, well, but what is the case if this is not a f prime of q bar, but a f prime of q? Then you use uh, the boundary condition. We know that the distance between two particles here is always bounded by something which is of order n to the minus one third. That's our boundary condition. If you remember, the boundary condition was that the distance in infinity norm, so also the distance for one pair of particles, is never larger than n to the minus one third. Otherwise, j is equal to 1. And if you have this boundary condition, and you know you have a cutoff of n to the minus one third, and this is what we had here in this, in this model, then you know that the derivative here is always bounded by a constant times the derivative there. So the worst case is, of course, if the one sits here and the other has the distance n to the minus one third, and then you see 
there's a constant between them. Maybe it's two or three. I don't remember. It's a constant. So what you always get is you get that you can bound it by some constant, which is n independent, which is given times the sum of f bar. Then you do law of large numbers. And you all know that if you do law of large numbers in this IID situation, that you have a deviation, which is like n to the sum delta. You can make it exponentially small, uh, the, the probability to be have this, uh, such a large deviation. And this is what closes this argument and also should convince you about the strength of the, the result. Now you see where we get this n to the minus one third. It comes from the fact that g, the, so to say, the expectation value should be bounded. This gives n to the minus one third. And now you also understand the cutoff. So the n to the one third, this thing appeared in two, part, uh, two separate situations talk once as the cutoff parameter it was n to the minus one third once the n plus one third was this factor in j here to get this c it's clear that the factors have to be the same so this has to match that it's n to the one third and not something else comes from here and then you finish the proof so this is all i wanted to say so we talked about that already and I just want to say, since time is more or less over, that there's also other systems where you can use techniques like that. And there's a few people who look at biological models, which also have the problems which, with singularities, which really use this technique now to uh, do this uh, derivation of the microscopic equation. What is the Keller-Siegel equation? Ah. I don't know. Ah, OK. This is a nice equation for the <laughs> following reason. Good, good you ask. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Because it, it describes a very interesting thing. I explained to the microscopic system. So to guess then the equation is not so hard. This is really like I did here with Vlasov. Is that, is that a coagulation, a fragmentation equation of some kind? Well, you have a system of, of n objects. Yes. In the biological system, these are some kind of amoebas. It's a slime yeah. mold. Yeah. And these amoeba, they move randomly do some Brownian motion. At the same time, they approach e each other. They have some kind of an attraction, and the attraction is really cool on attraction. The point is the system is first order, not second order. So the attraction doesn't change a momentum, which then acts back on the position. No, the attraction directly is a drift, so to say, directly changes the position. This is a microscopic model, and what you get is then the Keller-Siegel. So you have a drift term, which attracts uh, the system. Then you have a Brownian motion. and the interesting thing is the following. Uh, if, if the coupling constant of this attraction term is, there's a critical value. If it's subcritical, you see some nice clouds. Of course, the Brownian motion leads, leads to spreading. The attraction leads to clustering. And if you are be above this critical value, you can show that the solution of this microscopic if, um, thing always breaks down at a fine, typically breaks down at a finer time, and you lead to one cluster, so to say. Wow. Yes, right. And this is from the biologi biological point of view very important because the bacteria, the amoebas really do that. When they start to starve, the, the metabolism changes, they produce more of this kind of smell, and then they all cluster. And what they do afterwards is they form a spore fly away. And what bi biologists were always curious about is how do they do that? How do they know that all the other amoebas are also starving at the moment? How do they communicate, so to say, the fact that they are starving? And how does this really change all of a sudden the system from a cloud to, to some, some, let's say, cluster? And this can really easily be explained by this very simple model where you just have brown emotion and attraction. But, but you have a Coulomb attraction. You have a Coulomb attraction, wow. yeah in two dimensions. Well, this is natural. If, if you say, well, each amoeba emits some chemical substance, each amoeba smells, uh -huh. and you move towards the gradient of the smell, then the attraction you get is you directly... Get you get yes, yes. In two dimensions, it's the two-dimensional Coulomb, which as log I call Coulomb in two dimensions. Yeah, I think that's right. So the, the potential is log, the force is then like 1 over x. And this is interesting because you have this kind so of... Uh, it's, it's just from the... Uh, yeah, um, what they, they emit some kind of signal, uh, the amoeba do. Yes. What did you call it? It's some kind of scent or what? Pardon? It's, yeah, they, well, it's called chemotaxis, the effect altogether, that you move according to some chemical yeah, substance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this... Which, I, which, they, which they emit, right? Yes. 
And it's the most primitive way of communication you could think of, right? Somehow they have to communicate because the amoeba here has to know that also this one is starving and it's not only just here at their position. And how should they communicate? The most primitive form, which even plants use, is to, to, to emit some substance. Also plants communicate, right? Yeah, I, I've heard that. <laughs> yes, yeah. And I've heard that. So it's kind of remarkable. Yeah, well, that's the case. And not, yeah. And this is what they do, yeah. So thank you very much yeah, you. for the interest and the attention. Yeah.